just why it should have happened, or why it should have happened just when it did, he could not, of course, possibly have said. Nor perhaps could it even have occurred to him to ask. The thing was, above all, a secret. Something to be preciously concealed. And to that very fact, it owed an enormous part of its deliciousness. Theodore, perhaps you could tell us what the equator is. The equator is a line that goes around the middle of the Earth. Oh, I see. The, uh, the Earth is wearing a belt or a sash. <laughs> or someone drew a line around it. No, no, not that. I mean, well... Did you forget the word imaginary? Yes. Yeah. It was as if, in some delightful way, the secret gave him a fortress, a wall behind which he could retreat in heavenly seclusion. Moving up to the Arctic Circle, we again enter a zone of perpetual snow. All he needed to do was to think of that morning, the first one, and then of all the others. Suddenly, for no reason, he had thought of the postman, he remembered the postman. Perhaps there was nothing so odd in that. After all, he heard the postman almost every morning of his life. His heavy boots could be heard clumping round the corner at the bottom of the little hill street. And then, progressively nearer, progressively louder, the double knock at each door, the crossings and recrossings of the street, until finally the clumsy steps came stumbling across to the very door, and the tremendous knock came which shook the house itself. These constitute the vast wheat growing areas in North America and Siberia. But on that particular morning, the first morning, he had for some reason waited for the postman. But when at last the steps were heard, they had already come around the corner, a little up the hill to the first house. And even so, they were curiously different. And he had understood the situation at once. Nothing could have been simpler. There had been snow in the night, such as all season he had been hoping for. And it was this which had rendered the postman's first steps inaudible and the later ones faint. And even now it must be snowing. The white ragged lines drifting and sifting, whispering and hushing, seething, getting deeper and deeper, silenter and silenter. of snow falling about him, a secret screen of new snow between himself and the world. If he had not dreamed such a thing, and how could he have dreamed it while awake, how else could one explain it? He could not now remember whether it was on the first or the second morning, or was it even the third, that his mother had drawn attention to some oddness in his manner. know the difference between the North Pole and the Magnetic Pole? Perhaps it hadn't been even the second or third morning, or even the fourth or fifth. How could he be sure? How could he be sure just when the delicious progress had become clear? Just when it had really begun? All he knew was that at some point or another, perhaps the second day, perhaps the sixth, he had noticed that the presence of the snow was a little more insistent. The sound of it clearer, and conversely, the sound of the postman's steps more indistinct. Not only could he not hear
hear the steps come round the corner. He could not even hear them at the first house. It was above the first house that he heard them. And then, a few days later, above the second. And a few days later, above the third. Gradually, gradually the snow was becoming heavier. The sound of the seething louder. The footsteps more and more muffled. When he found each morning on going to the window that the roofs and the streets were as bare as ever, it made no difference. This was, after all, only what he had expected. It was even what pleased him, what rewarded him. There, outside, were the bare streets, and here, inside, was the snow. Snow growing heavier each day, muffling the world, hiding the ugly, and deadening, increasingly above all, the steps of the postman. Paul! Your father thinks you might need a new lamp upstairs for your studies. We've been worrying, Paul. We thought maybe it was eye strain that's been bothering you. How was one to explain? Would it be safe to explain? Would it merely mean that he would get into some obscure kind of trouble? And how could he explain his new world? How's school going, son? History was my favorite subject. I think I prefer geography. Especially when it takes one to the North Pole. Why the North Pole? Well, it would be fun to be an explorer. Like Perry, or Scott, or Bird. It was irresistible, this new world. It was miraculous. Its beauty was beyond anything. Beyond speech is beyond thought. Utterly incommunicable. And with each passing day, it increased. The snow became deeper, heavier. The sound of its seething more distinct, more soothing, more persistent. of mysterious power in his very secrecy. It must be kept secret. That more and more became clear. At whatever cost to himself, whatever pain to others. Perhaps you'll come out of your daydream long enough to be able to tell us, won't you, Paul? It is what we now call the Hudson River. And? He thought it was the Northwest Passage. He was disappointed. Thank you.
above the seventh house, his own house, that the postman had first been audible. The knock he had heard must have been the knock on his own door. The realization gave him abruptly, and even a little frighteningly, a sense of hurry. He was being hurried. He was being rushed. Did it mean, and this was an idea which gave him an extraordinary sense of surprise, that he would never hear the postman again? Was it all going to happen at the end so suddenly? Or indeed, had it already happened? Ah! After supper, the Inquisition began. And now take it slowly and, and uh, hold it if you can. Ah! How silly all this was. As if it had anything to do with his throat or his heart. Or lungs. Now, Paul, I just want you to read this, as you as you naturally would. And another praise have I to tell. For this the city, our mother, the gift of the great God, a glory of the land most high, the might of horses, the might of the sea. No, there's no sign of superficial eye strain at all. We could have his eyes examined. But I believe it's something else. Even here, even among these hostile presences, the snow was waiting, out of sight, with an air that said, Wait, Paul. Just wait. Is there anything that worries you very much? Oh, no. I think not. Are you quite sure? You needn't answer at once, Paul. Remember, we're trying to help you. Think it over and be quite sure, won't you? Wait, Paul. Just wait till we're alone together. Then I will tell you something new, something cold, something sleepy, something of cease and peace and the long, bright curve of space. Banish them. Refuse to speak. Leave them. Go upstairs to your room. I will be waiting for you. I will tell you a story better than the snow ghost. I will surround your bed, close the windows, pile a deep drift against the door so that none will ever again be able to enter. Speak to them. I'm just thinking, thinking. An idea about what? About what? Yes, Paul, about what? Anything. <laughs> Paul, you're making this very painful for your mother. What are you thinking about? About the snow. What on earth? My dear, what do you mean? Just snow, that's all. I like to think about it. Tell us about it, my boy. That's all there is. There's nothing to tell. You know what snow is. Hurry, Paul, hurry. These last few precious hours. Mother, can I go to bed now? Please, I have a headache. Please. Mm -hmm.
effort, the seamless hiss advanced once more. Listen, it said. We'll tell you the last, the most beautiful and secret story. A story that gets smaller and smaller. That comes inward instead of opening like a flower. <laughs> 